Hi, I'm David Bonsack, Product Manager for Rheology at TA Instruments. I would like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. If you get disconnected at any time, please use the instructions you receive to log back in. You can access additional content by clicking the Documents icon at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. This includes speaker bios and related file downloads. And if you need help at any time, click the question mark icon. Please ask any questions you may have at any time during the presentation by submitting them through the Q&A window. We will answer as many of these as possible at the end of the webinar. Our guest presenter today is Dr. Terry Chen. Dr. Chen is a senior application support scientist with TA Instruments, supporting rheology and DMA. She received her PhD in polymer science from Sun Yat-sen University in China, specializing in polymer synthesis and characterization. She then moved to the University of Maryland, where she was first a postdoctoral researcher and later a research assistant professor, working in the area of biopolymer modification and analysis. Dr. Chen joined TA Instruments in 2004, where she provides customer support, consultation, and training. Dr. Chen has more than 50 publications in peer-reviewed journals and two U.S. patents. Today, Terry will share some of her experience in using rheology to test and understand the performance of adhesives. The title of her talk today is Strategies for Rheological Evaluation of Adhesives. Terry? Hello, everyone. Welcome to TA Instruments webinar. Our today's topic is on strategies for rheological evaluation of adhesives. Here is our today's agenda. First, we will give a basic introduction on rheology and rheological methodologies. Then we will discuss experimental designs to correlate with adhesive properties. Specifically, we will talk about viscosity measurement, tack and peel tests on rheometers, how to set up a dynamic time sweep to monitor curing, and then we will discuss how to design a good temperature ramp experiment, how to use frequency sweep and TTS results to correlate the end product properties and how to use creep test and creep TTS to predict shear resistance and code flow. At the end, we will introduce the benefit of using rheology interconversions. First of all, what is rheology? Rheology is the science of flow and deformation of matter. Rheology studies the relationship between a stress and a deformation. When you apply a stress to a purely solid, elastic material, such as a spring, you will find out that the stress you applied is linearly proportional to its deformation, which is the strain. The ratio of stress over strain is defined as the modulus of the material. When you apply a stress to a purely liquid, viscous material, such as water in a dash pot, you will see that the stress is linearly proportional to the rate of the deformation, which we call it shear rate. The ratio of stress over shear rate is defined as the viscosity of this material. Most of the materials we work on our daily basis, such as adhesives, have both elastic and viscous properties. Therefore, these kind of materials are viscoelastic. Rheology analysis plays a big role in, rheology, in adhesive industries. The rheological analysis results can be used to directly guide synthesis and formulation, help to troubleshooting processing problems, and also provide quantitative evaluations to the final product performance. First of all, rheology test results can be used to quantify molecular weight and molecular weight distribution of the base polymer in adhesives. Compare differences in polymer structures, such as branching or cross-linking. It also helps to compare differences between formulations. Second, rheology tests can also help to guide processing conditions. For example, in adhesive coating process, rheology measures shear viscosity of adhesive solutions or hot melts. It helps to guide the application's rolling speed. In adhesive curing, Rheology test results can help to optimize the curing conditions, such as temperature, humidity, or UV intensity. In addition, rheology can also quantitatively measure the end product performance. 
the measured rheological parameters can be used to directly correlate with adhesive, cohesive strengths and also elasticity. This table listed four commonly used rheological tests in adhesive analysis. First, a steady flow test can measure shear viscosity over a wide range of shear rate. The axial testing on a rheometer is typically used for measured tack and peel. The dynamic oscillatory tests are the most popularly used tests in adhesive analysis. First, this measurement measures the transition temperatures, such as glass transition. Also, the measured parameters, such as G prime, G double prime, or tangent delta, are directly used to correlate with the adhesive performance. A creep experiment can also be applied to directly measure the shear resistance, how good of an adhesive to resist to a cold flow over time. For people who are working with adhesive coating process, a steady shear flow viscosity measurement can be helpful to guide the processing conditions. For example, pressure sensitive adhesives are traditionally processed in two major methods, solvent coating or hot melt coating. This following figure shows a correlation of sample viscosity measured at different shear rate versus their properties and applications. The viscosity measured at low shear can help to compare and predict stability. How stable a formulation can be against sagging or sedimentation. Viscosity measured at medium shear is correlates to a liquid sample mixing and transportation such as pumping or pipe flow. The high shear viscosity measurement is directly correlates to the coating complication, uh, applications conditions. Here is an example of two water-based adhesive formulations. Formulation A is more shear thinning and formulation B is more Newtonian. So under low shear rate, formulation A shows much higher viscosity than B which indicates that A potentially should have better storage stability against phase separation and sedimentation. Both formulations have similar viscosity at medium shear, but since A is more shear thinning, at the application high shear rate, formulation A shows much lower viscosity compared to formulation B. This means a potentially could spread easily and coat thinner layers. One of the most commonly used methods for evaluating the tack performance of a pressure sensitive adhesive is described in ASTM D2979. This test can be conducted on a rotational rheometer using an 8 mm parallel plate geometry. We plate the sample between two parallel plates, apply a certain pressure for a short time, and then we pull off the plate with a speed of a certain millimeter per second, such as 0.1 millimeter per second. The maximum force that is required to pull the plate away is defined as the sample tackiness. In this type of test, breaking may occur in three different ways. If the bound force at the interface is stronger than the cohesion strength of the adhesive, breakage will occur between adhesive layers. If the cohesion strength is much stronger than the adhesion bound at the interface, then breakage will occur at the plate interface. Sometimes there will be a mixed breakage of both cohesion and adhesion. This following figure shows the tag testing results of a non-crosslinked and a crosslinked PSA sample. The crosslinked PSA shows significantly higher cohesion strengths due to the introduction of a crosslinking network. Therefore, failure occurred at the interface. The non-crosslinked PSA, however, has weaker cohesion bound so failure was observed to be between the adhesive polymer layers. Peel tests are usually conducted at different peel angles, such as 90 degrees or 180 degree. 
Using a SER geometry on a rotational rheometer, we can easily perform the peel test at 180 degrees. The peel strength can be measured uh, at different peel rate and also with different temperature. Dynamic oscillatory tests are the most commonly used rheological test in adhesive evaluations. In an oscillatory test, a sinusoidal stress is applied to the sample with a certain frequency. The sample response in deformation is monitored and recorded. If the input stress is within the linear viscoelastic region of the material, then the output strain should also be in a sinusoidal waveform. The shift, between, the, shift, the shift between the input stress and the output strain is the phase angle, which is used to describe the viscoelasticity property of the material. In an oscillatory test, the commonly reported parameters are G star, G prime, G double prime, and tangent delta. This slide shows all of the equations for calculating those parameters from rheological testing. G star is the complex, complex modulus. It is calculated from the ratio of com complex stress over strain. G star can be separated into two components, which are G prime and G double prime. G prime is the storage modulus. People also call that elastic modulus. It measures the elastic response of a material, the ability of the material to store energy. G double prime is the loss modulus. People also call that viscous modulus. It measures the ability of the material to dissipate energy, how much energy is lost as heat in an oscillation. Tangent delta is the ratio of G double prime over G prime. It measures the material's damping property, such as vibration or sound damping. All of these parameters follow this triangle relationship, which is shown in this slide. In many of those adhesive books and papers, people have provided information on how to correlate the dynamic testing results to the performance of adhesives. For example, the storage modulus G prime correlates to the cohesive strength of the material. It describes the bulk property of the adhesive. A higher G prime at high frequency, which correlates to high shear, indicates high peel strength. A high G prime at low frequency, which correlates to a long time, indicates a good cohesive shear resistance. The loss modulus, G double prime, describes the viscous response of the material. So it correlates to the adhesive property at the interface. A high G double prime at high frequency correlates to high adhesive peel strength at the interface. A high G double prime at low frequency correlates to a high adhesive shear resistance. Tangent delta is the ratio of G double prime over G prime. It measures the elasticity of a material. Low tan delta means sample has good elasticity and high cohesive strength. A high tan delta means sample is more damping and potentially have high adhesive strength. So how many different type of oscillatory experiment we can run? And what kind of information we can obtain out of each test? Here, we have listed some typical dynamic test method and their applications. First of all, a strain sweep or stress sweep experiment helps to measure material's linear viscoelastic region. It helps us to determine what strain to use for all other dynamic testing. A dynamic time sweep is commonly used to monitor curing. The curing can be monitored under a controlled temperature, humidity, or under a certain UV intensity. Dynamic frequency sweep provide direct correlation to samples tag, peel, and shear resistance information as a function of frequency or time. 
A frequency sweep experiment running on a polymer melt sample can also provide information on polymer's molecular weight and molecular weight distribution. The dynamic temperature ramp experiment is probably the most popular test in adhesive evaluations. It measures transition temperatures and also provides information of adhesive's operating temperature range. Many adhesives are cured or partially cured through heat, UV radiation, or under humidity. A dynamic time sweep experiment is typically used for monitor curing. This following figure shows an example of using a UV curing accessory attached to a DHR rheometer. The UV light on a control, with a controlled intensity was triggered on after 25 seconds of equilibration, and then it was remained on for 30 seconds. During this entire time, the modulus change of five different formulations was monitored. This type of rheological test allow us to quantitatively measure adhesive curing with different formulations, different controlled UV intensity, and also at different temperatures. In most cases, when material cures, they shrink in dimension. Adhesive curing shrinkage will cause product failure during the process. Using a rheometer with UV curing accessory, we can quantitatively monitor this shrinking phenomenon. As we can see from the figure on the left side of this slice, if we fixed the measurement gap during the measurement, we can quantitatively monitor the axial force buildup during curing, which is shown in the blue curve. For this particular sample, the force increased up to almost 15 Newton across a 20 millimeter diameter plate. And then after the curing is completed, the force slowly relaxed over time. If we actively release this shrinking force to zero during curing, then we can monitor sample dimension change. The blue curve on the right side of this figure shows how much the gap reduced during curing. The silicon-based adhesive curing is sensitive to the environmental humidity. Using a rheometer with a humidity control chamber, we can monitor the curing process with a controlled temperature and also humidity. This graph shows an example of monitoring a silicon cock curing under different humidity level. The results have shown that this sample cures much faster under a higher humidity environment. Dynamic time sweep experiment is probably the most popular test in adhesive evaluations. This figure shows an example of a non-cross-linked pressure-sensitive adhesive temperature ramp results. This test provides many information to the performance of this adhesive. First of all, glass transition, TG, is observed at 16.3 degrees based on the location of the 10 delta peak. Below glass transition, the sample is hard and brittle and has no tackiness. So the glass transition temperature is usually considered as the lowest application temperatures of a PSA. Above TG, sample softens and the modulus drops significantly. The sample behaves in a viscoelastic manner. At even higher temperatures, a non-cross-linked PSA will molten. This can be observed at the highest G prime, G double prime crossover temperature, which we described as Tx in this figure. For this measured adhesive, the Tx is observed to be at 75.9 degree. Above this temperature, adhesive flows like liquid and totally lose cohesive strengths. In general, the application temperature window of an adhesive should be between TG and TX. In the adhesive industry, sometimes people also use the Dahlquist criteria to describe and define applications window. The Dahlquist criterion states that 
the modulus of an adhesive should be between 50 to 300 kilopascal. When higher, the adhesive has difficulty wetting the substrate. But if lower, the adhesive has low shear resistance. So in certain applications, this TD is considered as the lower temperature limit for the application of an adhesive to a substrate. In addition to measure transition temperatures, this temperature ramp experiment also provides information on sample modulus. The rubbery plateau moduli, G prime and G double prime, are also commonly used to evaluate the cohesive and adhesive strengths of an adhesive. The dynamic temperature ramp experiment on adhesive base polymers can also be used to compare polymer molecular architectures such as molecular weight, molecular weight distribution, and cross-linking. For example, when testing the same type of adhesive polymers with different molecular weight, one will observe that if the polymer has lower molecular weight, and then it will show a shorter rubbery plateau region in a temperature ramp experiment. If after glass transition, the polymer shows a continuous decrease in G star or G prime instead of having a relatively flat rubbery plateau region, then it indicates that this polymer may have a broader molecular weight distribution. If the polymer is cross-linked, first it will show a higher Tg compared to the same polymer that is not cross-linked. Also, the rubbery plateau modulus of a cross-link polymer will be higher. The shape of the curve will be more flat and extend to much higher temperatures. A cross-link polymer will never molten. In some literatures, people use the rubbery plateau modulus value to quantitatively calculate the degree of cross-linking. Here is the summary of the polymer structural information we can obtain from a temperature ramp experiment. As we can see, when we perform a temperature ramp experiment from below glass transition until uh, up to molten state, the modulus of the material changes over five to seven decades. It goes from glass-like solid all the way to honey-like liquid. In this case, it is very challenging to use one single size geometry in one continuous procedure to obtain a good temperature ramp results. Here, I would like to introduce some guidance for a good temperature ramp experimental design. First of all, it is always good to load the sample at higher temperatures because the sample will be soft or molten so that it will be easy to trim. The most commonly used geometry for testing a PSA sample is the 8 mm parallel plate. If you do not intend to go through glass transition, a 25 mm plate is also okay to be used. The measurement temperature is usually going from below the glass transition till the sample is molten or before it degrades. The commonly used heating rate is at 2 to 5 degrees Per minute, and the commonly used frequency is at 1 Hz, or some people use 10 radians per second. The most challenged parameter setup is on the sample strain. Strain needs to be within the linear viscoelastic region of the sample. When sample undergo such a big change in physical property, it is important to have the capability of adjusting the strain during a temperature ramp experiment. In addition, both sample and geometry will expand or shrink as we change temperature. So it is important to have active axial force control to avoid sample slipping and also compensate for sample and geometry expansion and shrinkage. As we have just mentioned, setting up a good strain is the key for getting a good temperature ramp experimental results. So how do we decide what strain to use for a certain sample testing? 
This figure shows a series of string sweep tests at different temperatures from below glass transition until above glass transition. First, let's look at the red curves which is the strain sweep at minus 30 degrees C. As we can see, below glass transition, sample modulus is high. And at a strain of 1%, it, this measurement max out the instrument torque. It means that we are not able to go any strain higher than 1% to 2%. Also, below glass transition, sample is fragile. Using a large strain may crack the sample. Therefore, at low measurement temperature, using a smaller strain is preferred. Then let's look at the black curve on the bottom of this figure. This is the strain sweep experiment at 50 degrees C, which is above the glass transition. At this temperature, sample is really soft and has low modulus. A 1% strain will get a torque of less than 10 micronewton meter. So in this case, using a large strain will be preferred because small strains will result in some noisy data if your instrument is not on a perfect anti-vibration bench. Then the question is, how do we change the strain in the middle of a temperature ramp experiment? Different rheometers and different softwares using different methods to alter the measurement strain in the middle of a test. If you're using one of TA Instruments rheometers, such as a DHR or Aries G2 rheometer, there are two ways for adjusting the strain. One method is called auto strain. This method is good for both DHR and Aries users. As you can see from the screenshot on the left side, this method asks the operator to set up a torque window during a test. This torque window is not the instrument spec. It is particularly selected based on the fact that the measurement is within the linear viscoelastic region of the sample and also ensure a good signal to noise ratio. When the test strain requires the torque that is outside of this window, strain will be adjusted. The other method is for the DHR user. It shows on the right side of the slice. In the main temperature ramp uh, experimental procedure, operator enters a small strain that is in the linear viscoelastic region for the entire test. And then under control strain advanced tab, selecting non-iterative sampling, the software requires the operator to enter a lower torque limit. This lower torque limit is not the instrument low torque spec but it is a smart way to help adjusting the strain when sample becomes really soft. Now let's take a look at an example in the next slice. This is a temperature ramp experiment on a non-crosslink PSA sample. The measurement is from minus 30 degrees C up to 100 degrees C with a heating rate of 3 degrees per minute. The initial test strain was set at 0.05%, which was within the linear viscoelastic region of this sample and also appropriate for the measurement at the initial low temperatures. As the temperature increased up to above the glass transition, sample became a lot softer. The torque to control a 0.05% strain was reduced significantly. When the torque hit this lower torque limit, which in this case, we set it at two micronewton meter. The instrument automatically switched to use a torque control for the measurement. From this particular point up to higher temperatures, the measurement torque was fixed at two micronewton meter. So strain in this case will continuously increase uh, as the sample gets softer, but this strain will still be within the linear viscoelastic region. This method allows automatic strain adjustment and gives very good measurement results for all temperature ramp experiment for adhesives. The dynamic temperature sweep experiment is commonly used to evaluate the performance of end product. 
high modulus frequency, uh, high frequency modulus uh, correlates to peel strength, and the low frequency modulus are correlates to shear resistance. The modulus at medium frequency measures the performance of the adhesive. However, the maximum frequency a rotational rheometer can reach in one single test is only 100 Hz, which is 628 radians per second. This may not be high enough to mimic a certain high shear situation. Also, low frequency data may require days or years to collect which makes the measurement practically impossible. In this case, a time-temperature superposition technique can be explored to extend this measurement frequency range. Time-temperature superposition is a very useful theory. It is based on the observation that for a thermal rheologically simple material, the vis viscoelastic property generated at different temperatures are equivalent to the properties measured over a broad time or frequency scales. For example, in a dynamic testing, frequency sweep data collected under different temperature steps can be horizontally shifted along the x-axis, which is the frequency. After you select a reference temperature, any low temperature data will shift to high frequencies, and the high temperature data will shift to low frequencies. This allows access to a wide range of frequency, which is outside of the instrument capability. In addition to dynamic testing, time temperature superposition can also be applied to a transient test, such as stress relaxation or creep. The figure on the left side of this slide is an example of a TTS data on a non-cross-linked PSA sample. The reference temperature was selected at 20 degrees C. If you put this TTS master curve side by side with the dynamic temperature ramp data, you will easily see that these two results looks like a mirror image. This is the principle of time temperature effect. This figure shows the overlay TTS master curves of a non-crosslinked and a crosslinked PSA sample. The reference temperature was selected at 20 degrees C. From this test results, we can quantitatively compare the tack, peel, and shear resistance performance of these two types of adhesives. Alternatively, Shear resistance property can also be evaluated using a transient experiment, which is a creep test. Actually, creep is a more intuitive method to monitor cold flow of an adhesive. In a creep test, a constant stress is applied to the sample instantaneously and held for a certain period of time. During this time, the change of strain is monitored. Sample compliance is calculated from the ratio of strain over stress. In order to predict shear resistant property of an adhesive over a long time, such as months or years long, a creep TTS experiment can be performed. It is a multiple step creep experiment conducted at elevated temperatures starting from your reference temperature. The high temperature creep results can be shifted and also used to predict long-term performance. Here is an overlay of two creep TTS results of a non-crosslinked and a crosslinked PSA sample. Each TTS test takes only about, about one hour long, but the analysis results can be used to predict the property of over 10 to 12 days. From this measurement results, we can clearly see that the non-crosslink adhesive has significant creep over time. It displays poor shear resistance to a cold flow. In the last section of our today's talk, I would like to introduce the concept of using rheology interconversion. 
any materials in the world only has one set of linear viscoelastic properties. Within the linear viscoelastic region, the rheological properties of a material can be interconverted from dynamic to transient properties through relaxation and retardation spectrum calculations. This following chart shows the conversion route between dynamic and transient tests, such as stress relaxation or creep. TA Instruments Trio software can easily help the users to perform this kind of transformation calculation. So using this interconversion calculation, we can directly convert our dynamic TTS data into a transient creep data. So there is no need to perform two sets of separate TTS experiment. This interconversion technique helps us significantly save the experimental time. Here, let us summarize our today's talk. Rheology is a powerful technique that is widely used in adhesive industries. The rheological analysis can provide useful information on adhesive polymers structure property relationship guide adhesive processing, and also quantitatively evaluate the end product performance. Designing and selecting appropriate rheological test method and parameters are important to ensure good measurement and also accurate correlation to the adhesive properties. With this, I would like to conclude our today's talk. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will be very happy to take any questions. Thank you, Terry, for that informative presentation. A recorded version of this webinar will be archived and made available through the TA Instruments website. We will now begin the question and answer segment of this webinar. If you haven't already, please submit any questions you may have using the Q&A window. We will do our best to answer as many of these as possible. Thank you so much, Terry, for this wonderful presentation. And thank you to all our attendees today for joining us for this webinar. If you haven't submitted your question already, please feel free to enter this question uh, in the Q&A box. Uh, hopefully, my audio comes out better now. Um, but please feel free to uh, put in your questions in the Q&A box, and we will answer them in the order that we had received. So, Terry, one of the there's a couple of questions here on um, testing materials at high share rates. Um, which is, as you can under, as you can appreciate, is very important for waterborne adhesives. So the, one of the questions is, how can you make viscosity measurements up to high shear rates, and how does it relate to the overall extrusion quality of these liquid adhesives? Well, that is a good question. Thank you. Um, when people work with waterborne adhesives, you know, one of the common things they do is they do really high shear, you know, uh, applications. So a lot of cases I hear customers ask me the question like, can we really measure samples of viscosity using parallel plate or conon plate up to shear rate of way more than a thousand reciprocal second? They are talking about something over like ten thousands or even a hundred thousand reciprocal second. So can we really do so? The question, the answer to that is this can be a little bit challenge to be measured using a rotational rheometer. Um, typically, okay, you can give it a try because, you know, when you perform the measurement between a parallel plate and conon plate, so you have an open boundary. So what's going to happen is when you have the geometry rotate at a really high speed, sample will be spin out during, due to the centrifugation force. So in this case, you know, you can try to extend the possible measurement shear rate by reducing your measurement gap. All right, the smaller the testing gap, the better the plate can hold the sample up to higher shear rate. You should be able to measure your sample up to 10,000 reciprocal second shear rate using your regular parallel plate with a smaller gap. But if someone is constantly looking for a super high shear rate of viscosity measurement, and the other alternative solution will be you may have to consider to purchase a capillary rheometer, not a general rotational rheometer for that measurement. Because capillary rheometer, actually your sample is passing through a tiny, tiny die, a very small die. So then it will not have any spin out issue. And I hope I answered this question okay.
Yes, yes, and and I think the follow up there would be, what is the lowest gap that you can work with so that you can get to high enough of a share rate without the sample spinning out? Yeah, that is another good question. When we do training, people always ask that. So as we always say, for general rheological measurements, the commonly used measurement gap using a parallel plate geometry is somewhere from like 500 micron to no more than 2 millimeter, depending on sample. If you work with a very high stiffness modula, uh, high stiffness sample like a PSA, you usually want to use a higher gap like a 2 millimeter. But when measuring low viscosity liquid sample, you want to use a lower gap also in order to achieve higher shear. So the general gap is 500 to 2 millimeter. But if you really want to achieve higher shear rate, you can still re further reduce your measurement gap. Um, for example, you can use 100 micron gap. You can also use even lower gap than 100 micron. But one thing you need to remember, the smaller the gap, the more edge influence you're going to have. So that's why you may actually you have to balance between, right, how accurate viscosity measurement is and also how high the shear rate you can achieve. So I have to say that I have used something like a 50 micron gap for, you know, for the measurement in order to reach really high shear without spinning the sample out. And however, there's another thing you need to keep in mind is like in order, you know, if you're going to use a smaller gap, you have to make sure that your sample does not contain large, large particles. Because if you sample containing large particles, and then reducing gap, you may end up just grinding those particles. So the measurement viscosity is not going to be correct. And usually the rule of thumb we say that, okay, you know the size of your particles in, the, in your formulation. The gap you select is, should be 10 times greater than the diameter of the particle. That's a rule of thumb empirical condition that people usually use. Perfect. Thank you so much, Terry. And I'm sure we can keep talking about the same topic for the next 20 minutes, but I would like to cover some other questions as well. One thing I would like to add for the audience is we still have a record of the questions. So if we haven't completely answered or if you want more details on some of the questions that we are talking about or we run out of time and cannot cover your question, uh, we will share an email address. Um, and uh, that's something you can, or you can go to our website and reach out to us, and we'll be happy to start the conversation that way as well. Um, Terry, Terry, there have been a couple of questions on tack testing, um, so I'll co combine them. One is, um, what is the maximum load that you can use for your tack testing data that you showed, and what is the material that uh, of the material with which the tack fixture is made out of? Okay, so the the slides I show in my presentation, I was using a rotational rheometer for this tack measurement. <clears throat> there are also people using a general mechanical <clears throat> mechanical tester, the uh, universal mechanical tester for this type of test, right? So the regarding the, 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 this is all depending on what instrument do you use. For a rotational rheometer, the one I was used, okay. So the maximum load you can measure is 50 newton on the discovery hybrid rheometer. If you have one of TA Instruments Aries G2 rheometer, and then the maximum load you can do, you can use for the tech testing is two, uh, 20 Newton. And um, the material, okay, the, the geometry, the surface texture, the surface geometry I use is a stainless steel geometry. Of course, I know for tech testing also, you may have to, you know, consider the surface material. What, you know, what surface are you, are you going to use? Um, one recommendation I can give you is you can consider to glue different type of surfaces to our disposable plate geometry so that it will match the real application's condition. So that actually could, could give you a more close to the real application techiness uh, situation that you would like to evaluate or compare. Absolutely, and that was a great idea, um, Terry. When you have working with custom materials, you can, when you use our disposable geometries, you can still attach your some sort of uh, custom material to that disposable geometry, and then you can get a better simulation of your end process in that regard. 
Correct. Um, that is correct. Um, yep. you can, usually what I do is I use crazy glue. You know, Then it doesn't really affect too much. But one thing I want to remind you is you need to zero the gap with whatever you glue down to the geometry before you load your sample. Absolutely, yes. Um, and the material of construction for our geometries, um, so for our non-disposable geometries is stainless steel, and for our disposable geometries is aluminum. So that kind of gives you a flavor from the materials that we would supply with our standard setup. Um, Terry, there's been a, a repeated question here, so I'll summarize it uh, about measurement of glass transition. So uh, as we all know, glass transition can be measured with different techniques. Um, so there is, we showed some excellent data on measuring it using a rheometer. And uh, it's also commonly measured using a differential scanning calorimeter or a DSC. So how would the two data compare and how would you determine which technique is best suited for a particular measurement? That's a good question. This question has been asked a lot. Since TA Instruments is making multiple different thermal and rheological type of instruments, so people will be asking the same questions a lot, you know, saying, okay, now you have a DSC that can measure glass transition, you have a rheometer, you also have a DMA that can all measure glass transition, then which one should I use? And which one is the best? Well, uh, the answer to this question is like, first of all, glass transition measured using different instruments are defined from different mechanisms, right? In a DSC measurement, the glass transition is monitored based on the heat flow, uh, heat flow step change. And the glass transition measured using a rheometer and also a DMA are defined as the modulus change and you know storage modulus decrease and the loss modulus peak or the 10 delta peak. It's defined in different ways. So do they match each other? I would say depending on your test conditions. So if you're, you know, the DMA and rheology always handle a big size of sample. And also DMA and rheometer always use a big piece of metal clamp or metal geometries. So all of these will lack the measurement temperature, right? It, including also your sample will lack the measurement temperature. So usually, if you measure the glass transition of your adhesive material using rheology and DMA, you may potentially see the glass transition show up at a slightly higher temperature versus the glass transition you measured using the DSC. But if you significantly slow down the heating rate, make sure a sample really can follow. And yes, you are able to get a reasonable match between a DSC results versus a rheology and DMA results as well. But then let's talk about which instrument is more beneficial with glass transition measurement. We can keep talking on this topic for long, but I'm just going to give you a quick summary of that. So DSC is using the heat flow curve to identify glass transition temperature. So DSC technique is really good to measure small molecules glass transition, but if, the poly if, if working with a polymer that is highly crystallized or highly cross-linked, then DSC technique may not be sensitive enough, as sensitive as the using the rheology, rheometer and DMA. All right, so if your polymer is highly crystallized or like if the polymer is highly cross-linked, and then using DSC technique, the glass transition measurement is not going to be as sensitive. But on, in the meantime, if you choose to use a rheometer or to use a DMA technique, you can still identify, clearly identify the glass transition. Absolutely, and um, one other thing to remember here is that with a rheometer or a mechanical tester, you basically get two pieces of information. You get the glass transition temperature, and you also get the modulus, the tan delta, and the viscosity information at the same time. So when you're trying to answer the question, what instrument is the best, um, there's a technical criteria that Terry mentioned. It's the kind of material you're testing, but we also want to look at what is the problem that you're trying to solve. Are you trying to get a simple QC measurement, or is your material not having enough, it's not having the optimal end performance properties, which is where this TG measurement is important, because the end performance properties is a combination of both the glass transition and your material's mechanical properties at the application temperature and how it relates to the glass transition. So there are a lot of different interplaying factors over here that 
that you have to ask ask yourself or ask um, your customers about the end end purpose of making a glass transition measurement. Good point. Um, Thanks for for this uh, additional information that Yash provided. But uh, one one more thing I wanted to add into I forgot to mention is like the DMA and rheology technique not only measure glass transition, it is also a very sensitive technique to investigate a sub sub ambient transitions like beta gamma transitions of a polymer, mm -hmm. which DSC cannot do. Absolutely. So we have some very clear distinguishing criteria on choosing the right technique for the measurement um, and definitely feel free to reach out to us if um, you need more information on this um, we have a lot of good literature on it um, it was we have we have so much literature that it was not possible actually to post it all on this platform so if you need to uh, if you need some literature just let us know just reach out to us and we'll be happy to engage in that conversation with you um, there's been some couple of questions now on time temperature superposition. So I did want to spend some time covering that. So you mentioned that TTS is typically applicable for rheologically simple materials, but a lot of our customers are working with complex mixtures where they have some sort of rheological modifiers, they have some fillers. So how would you, um, how would you guide them on employing TTS for understanding the material better? That is a good question. Time temperature superposition, when they first created, you know, observed, you know, they investigate this theory, it is said that this only applies to simple polymers, which has like thermal, rheologically simple polymers. That means the polymer is linear with no fillers, no crystallization, no cross-linking. However, over the years, you know, people abuse this theory a lot. And interestingly, based on all this many years of experience, people observe that time temperature superposition works quite well with PSAs and also help melt. Uh, nah, not crystallized and under molten condition. Molten polymers and also PSAs, TS, uh, TTS works really well with that. Well, even though some of the TS, uh, PSAs can be partially cross-linked and, you know, and also has fillers, but you will see that it's still reasonably working well. So the way you find it out, what, you know, whether or not TTS theory really works with your material, you have to just try and see it. So, so in one of my presentation slides, you know, the, uh, the, the demonstration TTS analysis, that is actually a real data from a non-crosslinked PSA. All right, so basically you just perform a temperature step frequency sweep measurement. After the test, you overlay all the frequency curves, and um, you know there are some there are some uh, some literatures talk about you know the way to evaluate if TTS works with your polymer. One way is like you overlay all the curve using the uh, uh, Van Gerf Palman plot. So if you see all the frequency sweep curves at, measured at different temperature steps, they all actually overlap together into a good a reasonable smooth curve, then you know TTS works. And to my experience, I usually just say, since we already spent the time, did the measurement at different temperatures, why don't we just try to use the software directly, try to do this uh, TTS shift? If it works reasonably well, and that is perfect. If it doesn't, some material may require a little bit of vertical shift due to uh, the uh, you know, due to some uh, some fillers, due to some density change. So with that vertical, you know, compensation, so you can still get a reasonable TTS uh, theory, uh, TTS shift results. So the conclusion is the adhesive materials, most of those PSA type of materials, TTS applies quite reasonable. So don't be terrified by the, uh, the theoretical TTS theory saying it's only applied for simple polymers. You can still try your material and it could still get a reasonable fit with the TTS theory. Absolutely, and we, like in my experience, I've actually performed TTS on carbon black filled materials and it has worked pretty well. Um, so it really depends, again, on your material. Um, that is the very definition of the method being empirical. The theory was der derived using simple systems, but it can work for complex systems as well. And another thing we want to appreciate is that the, generally when we run TTS, 
you are trying to predict the material's behavior over months or years. So whereas the time scale of a TTS experiment, even if I include the data processing, is no more than 12, 12 hours, 15 hours at most. So that is, that is time well invested to understand if a particular method is going to give you reasonable results for predicting the long-term behavior of your material. And Terry, on the same subject, I think there was one question um, about how you can switch between dynamic data that you obtain either in a regular frequency sweep or uh, in a TTS uh, to transient data, uh, which is creep and stress relaxation. I think you presented a slide on it, but um, I would ask the attendee just to send us an email and uh, we will be able to send you a more detailed presentation and anybody else who is interested in performing these interconversions between the dynamic and transient data, feel free to send us an email and um, we'll be able to share you a more detailed presentation on how to perform those interconversions. Yes, uh, correct. And TA Instrument software is capable of doing this conversion as long as your sample fit with TTS quite well. So mm -hmm. you can always use TA Instruments trail software to perform this conversion calculation. It's back and forth. So like what Yash just mentioned, send us an email. We can probably uh, create a step-by-step -step instruction to show you how to do this conversion. Absolutely. Um, Terry, there have been a couple of questions on sample loading, and um, we can all appreciate that the sample loading techniques for a PSA versus a hot melt versus a water boon adhesive will be quite different. So maybe like to, like as we come to the close of the webinar, can you share some of your experiences on sample loading these different kind of materials? Yes, yes, certainly. I can certainly do so. So let's start with PSA. So PSA, if your sample is a non-cross-linked, all right, so that means it's going to get molten at high temperature. For that kind of sample, I always recommend you load the sample at higher temperature when the sample is under molten states. Why is that? It's because it's easier to trim sample. If your goal is to obtain, if you want to measure the accurate sample moduli, so the critical part is like you need to load the sample and have the sample uniformly across your geometry. Usually it is 8 millimeter or no, no bigger than 25 millimeter diameter geometry. So you, you need to have a reasonable good trimming after sample loading. In order to be able to trim the sample, you need to load the sample at higher temperature when the sample is soft or when the sample is molten. So that's for uh, non-crosslinked PSA. For partially crosslinked PSA, they're very tacky, very difficult to handle. So then how do we load the sample? Based on my experience, I usually prefer still load the sample at high temperature. So because at high temperature, they are softer. So then you squeeze the sample until the sample is fully uh, loaded across your geometry area. And then how do we trim? That's going to be a really difficult and challenging thing. Sam sample I trimmed using a razor blade. It has to be really sharp. So you use tweezers and razor blade to do a reasonable trimming. Sam sample, there's really hard. It's really hard to trim. So then the only way you can load and get reasonable reproducible results is by what? Prepare the sample, all pre-prepare the sample into a disk shape or at least the same amount. Rolling the PSA into a ball and then actually make sure they're always about the same amount. And squeeze the sample until you see the sample is actually uh, spreading across uniformly across your 8 millimeter diameter plate. And with that, applying an appropriate axial force is also very critical. So for a non-crossing PSA, any force you apply to the plate, you're going to squeeze everything out. But for partially crossing PSA, you need to really do some research regarding how much force you actually can apply to it. Because without applying the force, the geometry and the sample may not be in full contact. If you're applying too much force, then you're going to squeeze sample out. So this will require some kind of research. You gradually increase the force, make sure the force stabilized there without further squeezing the sample, but it's stabilized there at this temperature. And then you can use that force 
during throughout this entire measurement. Apply that force during, and then you conducting a cooling. And for PSA temperature ramp analysis, you can either do a cooling test, 3C a minute, from high temperature directly cool down to below the TG, or you can load the sample at high temperature and then hold the force, cooling it down to your initial temperature, which is below TG, and then do your heating. And depending on polymers, sometimes I notice that for PSAs, cooling and heating curve does not seem to have a very big hysteresis. They respond to the temperature pretty fast, so you don't, sometimes you don't seem to see a very big hysteresis. If that's the case, and then you don't have to load the sample at high temperature, cool it down, and do heating. You can actually directly load the sample at high temperature and do a cooling, because if the curve matches quite well. And that's for PSA. For hot melt adhesive, okay, I always load the sample at molten state. I, okay, okay, I, go, I preheat the geometry, load the sample at a high temperature, and then and with applying a certain axial force, if the sample hot melt, is, if it's not cross-linked, I make sure that I have the, sample, the force on the sample to be zero plus minus a window, like 0.1 Newton, zero plus minus 1.1 Newton before I cool it down to my initial temperature, and then I do heating test. For hot melt adhesive, you need to do heating. Cooling and heating, there will be a hysteresis because your polymer can contain multiple in ingredients and there is something crystallized, so there will be a hysteresis. So I will load the sample at high temp, cool it down, and then do the heating test. For liquid sample loading, um, liquid sample testing, usually you do that using parallel plate or conum plate, right? So if your sample can, has really, really low viscosity, there could be, and also low surface tension, there could be some challenge. Like you put sample on the bottom plate, before you lower your upper plate, the sample already flows really, really flat. It cannot fill the gap between your measurement gap, right? It cannot fill that. So in, for that, sample, that really low viscosity formulation sample, if you would like to load it between the measurement gap, uh, we have a tech tip video. If you go to YouTube video or TA Instruments tech tips, there is a tech tip video I recorded years ago regarding how to handle this kind of super low viscosity samples. So basically, you lower, you, you go to a, a gap which is about one millimeter or somewhere around one to two millimeters and then set the upper geometry slowly rotating. And you use your pipette to load the sample from the edge of the parallel plate or conum plate, from the edge. And then since the upper plate is slowly rotating, then the, centric, you know, the, the force actually, the rotation actually is going to move your sample to the center. So after you load the sample with the right volume, and then you further lower your upper geometry to your final measurement gap. With this method, actually, there will be no air bubbles trapped in. So this actually will give you the most uniform sample loading with no air bubble. This is a method of loading low viscosity liquid sample. Um, and also there's a YouTube video with that. Um, I think I covered all of the material sample loading, right, Yash? Yes, yes, and um, that was definitely like the top three materials that we, um, we had questions on. There is one more question. There is one fourth type of material, but the question is not more on sample loading. It is about the thermal profile that you would use, and that is for thermoset adhesives. Um, so, what kind of uh, what kind of a thermal profile would you recommend for curing of adhesives? Uh, and uh, also, just at a way, like as a summary, what are the different options in the software that you would highly recommend users to use when programming a method on the rheometer? Oh, for thermal setting curing, uh, thermal setting adhesives, we actually have another webinar you can find from our website uh, talking about using thermal, rheological, and DMA technique to characterizing a thermal setting materials. Thermal setting materials including thermal setting polymers, composite polymers, also include thermal setting adhesives, right? So depending on what kind of thermal setting uh, adhesive that you're working with, typically you can do isothermal curing, so that will be a, you know, you load your sample, immediately conduct a time sweep measurement. So what you're measuring is sample curing as a function of time. But there are some other uh, 
other curing profiles, you can also use your rheometer to mimic a real curing profile by conducting a okay, a temperature ramp followed by isothermal or multiple different heating rate temperature ramp profile because some of the adhesive materials, they are cured with different temperature profiles. You heat with a really rapid rate to a temperature, hold for one hour, and then heat slowly to another temperature, hold, and then cool it down, something like that. The rheology software, not does, you know, any rheology, general rotational rheology in, instrument software will allow you to program those kind of temperature profile. The measurement is usually a dynamic testing with a constant frequency and also with a strain that's in the linear viscoelastic region. Absolutely. And um, I don't know if you mentioned this, but also it's important to have axial force control so that yeah, oh, as yes. your material shrinks or expands, the head will move up or down to ensure that the gap always remains completely filled. And um, depending on the rheometer you are using, you, you would also be uh, using non-iterative sampling, so that's for the DHR rheometers, and auto strain for the Aries rheometers. So these are two features um, that I, we would highly recommend that you use. And again, we have very detailed videos uh, on our YouTube channel and on our website, specifically on how to use axial force control and how to use auto strain and how to use non-iterative sampling. Uh, so definitely feel free to check those out. The one other experience that I will share from my end, Terry, is uh, whenever I'm working with a thermosetting material, I often first start with a temperature ramp um, because I assume that I know nothing about this material. So I will often perform a temperature ramp to identify a temperature window where I can start seeing the curing take place. And then based on that temperature window, I select a couple of temperatures at which I can run my isothermal experiments. And that general, that's generally been my approach to optimize the temperature or the thermal profile. Um, and sometimes you're just replicating the end process. So if the oven temperatures for curing are 300 Fahrenheit or 350 Fahrenheit, then that's what you have to work with. But in my experience, sometimes those temperatures also can be fine-tuned further if you um, take a step backwards and try to re-optimize them. So again, just a little bit of experience from my side that I wanted to share with everyone. Um, I think we are reaching close to our uh, end time. We are actually over time, but this is great. We've been having really good discussion. Um, we have time for maybe one last question um, where uh, Someone's asking about, uh, you showed the graph of different uh, of, of the temperature ramp of where the storage modulus was decreasing as a function of temperature. Um, and you had something labeled as G prime P. Um, so can you explain the significance of G prime P? Is it something that's specific on the PSA or it's something that you can see uh, on other kinds of adhesives? And what is its physical significance? Good question. That's a good question. In my temperature ramp slides, I showed a multiple indicators that people use to evaluate the performance of PSAs, right? So in that graph, the G prime P is referring to the plateau modulus. All right, because the, the plateau modulus usually is used to evaluate or compare the performance of different type of PSAs. But okay, this is the question is, you know, where is the plateau is? Some polymers has like uh, pretty narrow molecular weight distribution, so the plateau is pretty flat. Then you can easily average and take one that's the rubber plateau. Some of the uh, PSAs, you know, there's no a there, you don't observe a very flat plateau. So after TG, you will see the modulus will continuously drop. Then how do we define the GP? I've been trying to discuss this question with some people in the PSA industries. And I saw some of the people that are also in the uh, in the uh, in the attendee today. Um, yeah, based on what I heard from the PSA industries, they said, well, instead of really find a plateau, you can actually pick a temperature. So, for example, the modulus after TG at 50 degrees C. So use that as consider that as a plateau modulus, and for that you can still get get a reasonable comparison from different type or different formulation of your PSA sample. Absolutely, and uh, 
do you think pr the presence or absence of a plateau is any indicator of the structure of the material that you are studying? It has something related with your formulation and also molecular weight distribution. So the polymer architecture, if the polymer has a really broad molecular weight distribution, which is very common for PSA, then you will not be observing a very flat rubber plateau region. And also if your polymer, especially for non-crosslink PSAs, this plateau is not going to be very flat. If your polymer is very, very you know, it's reasonably cross-linked PSA, so you will see a very flat uh, rubber plateau region. So then in that case, it's easy to define what GP is, like plateau region. Absolutely. And even uh, polymers that are crystalline, uh, which have a higher degree of crystallinity, are likely to show a plateau in the G prime. Or is, did I get that wrong? Uh, you get it correct. For a hot melt adhesive, after TG, you will see a pretty, pretty flat rubber plateau modulus because there are some uh, uh, crystal, crystals in the polymer so that hold the structure quite stable with temperature. It will never drop until the crystal melts. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, that's all the time we have today, unfortunately, for um, the webinar. I think we tried to answer most of the questions, but uh, we have the questions, uh, uh, we will have the record of the questions, so we will go through them and make sure that uh, we either reach out to you directly uh, answering the questions that you've asked and we've not been able to answer. Or uh, if if it slips through the cracks, uh, we have posted our email address. It's rheologysupport at tainstruments.com. Uh, feel free to send us an email at that email address um, and we'll be happy to again discuss it in more detail with you. Again, thank you so very much for your attendance today. I hope you found the webinar useful. At the end of the webinar, there will be a short survey, so if you can please spare two minutes to fill up that survey, um, we would really appreciate it. Uh, thank you again so much, um, and um, um, hope you guys have a wonderful rest of the day, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are joining us from. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.